Thanks. Uh, in, in many ways, the Haskalah might seem to present a perfect opportunity for Yiddish playwrights to roll up their sleeves, sharpen their pens, and get to work dramatizing the key issues of the day. First of all, Western drama boasts a long history of such activity. Think, for example, of Aristophanes making a mockery of man's rush to war in Les Estrada, or the anonymous author of Everyman reminding audiences of how fleeting life is and of the importance of getting one's spiritual affairs in order, or Moliere bursting bubbles of hypocrisy and self-importance at every turn. There are countless other examples, of course, but I haven't chosen these at random. Once Haskalah drama gets off the ground, it will consist largely of satires in the tradition of Aristophanes. It will always rest on a didactic foundation like Everyman and other moral uh, morality plays. And it will borrow quite openly from masters like Moliere in ways that we shall soon see. Another indirect link to plays like Everyman is that morality and mystery plays of the medieval period were powerful means of educating the often unlettered masses in vivid ways that would be harder to achieve in, say, a church sermon. At first glance, the Haskalah might seem to present an analogous situation. Here is a top-down movement looking for a variety of ways to reach the general population, by no means illiterate, but with minimal exposure often to secular Western learning. Drama, then, would seem to offer unique opportunities by which Yiddish playwrights could grapple with pressing issues, just as their predecessors writing in English, French, and other tongues did in the medieval and early modern periods. There was one problem, however. There was hardly such a thing as a Yiddish playwright at this point, and limited Yiddish theatrical activity at all. The main form of theatrical performance that existed in the Yiddish-speaking world before the Haskalah was launched in the last couple of decades of the 18th century was the Purimspiel, or Purim play, usually performed in Yiddish and usually with didactic matters far out of mind. On the contrary, the Purimspiel took advantage of, indeed owed its very existence to, the Saturnalian spirit of the holiday. Purimspiel reveled in bawdry, coarse jokes, scatological humor, and so on. It's not to say they were never topical, but they were rarely, if ever, didactic. Wolfson also saw the Purim Spiel, Aaron Halle Wolfson, that is, the author of, of uh, Leichsen und Fremelei, uh, saw the Purim Spiel as a benighted phenomenon, reveling in exactly the sort of superstition that he and his fellow Maskiling were trying to purge from Jewish society. So Wolfson, on top of his many other activities carried out in Mendelssohn's footsteps, set out to replace the Purim Spiel with a new, modern sort of Yiddish play. Such a work, he believed, would help advance the goals of the Haskalah, in particular the need for Jews to broaden their secular education and modify their behavior in order to become better integrated into non-Jewish society, but without sacrificing the integrity of their Jewish beliefs and traditions. It's not to be taken for granted that Wilson chose to tell this story either in dramatic form or in Yiddish, or at least partially in Yiddish. Growing up in a fairly well-to-do Prussian Jewish household, he was raised speaking German, um, rather than Yiddish, unlike the experience of almost all of Eastern, Jewry, uh, Eastern European Jewry at the time, and of course the vast majority of Europe's Jews at this point lived east of Prussia. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of discussion among uh, scholars of Yiddish literature, uh, and, and for that matter modern Hebrew literature, the sort of tension between uh, Hebrew and Yiddish, and the, the self-doubt that the Moschilim often had, you know, a lot of Moschilim who openly expressed their disdain for Yiddish, but wrote in it anyway, often with long apologies as, as prologues, because it was the pragmatic thing to do. Um, I'm not sure that that's what Wolfson was doing, because here he is in Berlin, he's not off in Odessa or, or somewhere like that, um, and we, we, we can ask some questions about what exactly he, where, where he thought this play would go, but it's interesting that not only was it published first in 1796, but it went into a second edition a couple of years later, um, quite unusual for a Haskalah play. Um, and uh, Jeremy Dauber, my, my colleague and co-translator, translator says, it's not a Yiddish play, it's a play with Yiddish in it. Um, which I think is fair depending on how you define Yiddish, and we could spend all day on that if we wanted to. The linguistic world of this play is a very particular one, and clearly the playwright mapped it out very carefully. Its eight characters can be placed along a spectrum of language and register, with Hochdeutsch on one end, and Rabbinic Hebrew and Aramaic, what Yiddish speakers call a Shintoidish, on the other. Somewhere in the middle lies dialogue, sometimes akin to modern Yiddish, uh, sometimes it's significantly Germanized, sometimes less so. 
And so I want to introduce the major characters based on where we find them along this continuum. The title of the place invites us to start at the extremes. Leichtsinn und Fremelei are not terms that you'll hear a Yiddish speaker say much, if ever. Jeremy Dabber and I chose to translate this as silliness and sanctimony. Another good choice might be frivolity and false piety. The former term in each pairing clearly refers to Yetka, the highly assimilated daughter of a wealthy Prussian Jewish businessman, Reb Henoch. Indeed, one could reasonably refer to Yetkin as a self-hating Jew, for she shows nothing but contempt for Jewish tradition, and indeed for Jews themselves. A case in, her, in point is her practice of going out with Gentile suitors, even though many of them come from openly anti-Semitic families. In dramaturgical terms, let's call this issue the proverbial loaded gun that Anton Chekhov refers to. If you put it on stage in Act One, the rules of drama, drama demand that it will have to go off in in Chekhov's case, it's Act 4. In Vos's case, it's Act 3, the last act. I'll say more about the metaphorical gunshot after we read the scene. Other signs of her lack of substance are her self-evident vanity, her excessive attention to her appearance, and her superficial relationship with arts and, and letters, it's something that Shmuel Feiner touched on this morning, that, that world of all these secular arts and, and letters. Um, for Yechen, attending plays and operas is just another gateway to romantic dalliances, well, while she has become bored with the pulp fiction in her home library. It's a means for her of killing time rather than of using it constructively. And the words that come out of her mouth are as Germanized as the operas and novels that attract her, a clear linguistic sign of how distant she is from Jewish tradition. Um, the Fremelei, on the other uh, side of the spectrum, uh, religion-based sanctimoniousness represents the, the play's other moral pole, which is inhabited by Reb Yosef, described in the cast of characters simply as a Hoys Reb. Uh, in other words, he is a live-in tutor. Uh, and we've talked a number of times about hiring tutors. And interestingly in the play, so um, Reb uh, Yosef has been hired to tutor uh, the son. Uh, I, I think he's in his early teens. We never see him. Maybe, he, maybe he's a bit younger, I forget uh, if, if that's even specified, but we never see him. He's referred to, and I would say that he's quite important, um, but he's sort of present by his absence. And the, the play then deals to a certain extent about the, the sort of gender separation in terms of what do you teach the children and how much does it matter whether it's a boy, uh, whether, whether it's a girl. There's also, there are also gender differences uh, on, in the older generation. There are, there are differences between the parents as to what they feel about the education of, of both son and daughter. So all of these are, are brought up here. Um, the the uh, Rabbi Yosef, the Polish Hasid, has been hired by Reb Hanach to teach the son. Uh, and where Yetchid has her secular text, the Breti novels and Biedu, Reb Yosef has the seminal Jewish text at his disposal. But the problem is that Reb Yosef can freely manipulate these texts toward unsavory ends, since his employer Reb Hanach's knowledge of their contents is minimal. Near the beginning of the play, Reb Yosef manages to convince Reb Hanach to grant him his daughter Yetkin's hand in marriage, a step that we know the father was considering anyway, and Yosef sort of nudges him in that direction. But when the boss is away, Reb Yosef literally is chasing the family's maid, Shangle, around the bedroom. Um, by the way, Shangle speaks um, more or less German, but with the odd Yiddish word uh, like uh, Breuges or Balibos uh, thrown in. So um, we can, you know, you can ask some questions about where that's coming from, uh, too. Um, so when, when, when Reb Yosef and Shandl are caught in flagrante delicto, fully clothed, mind you, because we're still in the 18th century, um, he thinks quickly, creatively summons some helpful uh, Hebrew and Aramaic phrases, and effusively thanks his boss for saving him from his own yetzelhala, his evil inclination. The language in which this occurs adds significant texture to the play's sociolinguistic landscape. And so I'll give you a moment from the, our, our translation, because I think this helps sort of establish who Rabbi Yosef is. Rabbi Yosef, Baruch HaMok and Baruch Hu, blessed is the omnipresent, blessed is he, that you've come, that is. You are my savior. For you've saved my soul from death and my steps from downfall. If you hadn't come in when you did, God only knows what might have happened. Rav Hedok says, just tell me what did happen. 
Reb Yosef and Yitzri Takva Alai, my evil impulse triumphed over me. But it's as our sages say, Aveda Goreras Aveda, if you do one sin, you're going to do another. I come in, I think you're home, knew I was going to take my medicine before I got sick. I took the Gemara down and I learned, Im Pagabachab Nenuvulzeh Mashchehu Lebesmedlish, if this evil impulse hits you, then drag it to the house of study. That's what I learned, but what can I tell you? It was an evil hour. Oh, whoa, my sins. Oh, whoa, my transgression. So he makes this very elaborate show of it, and it, it works a charm. The lascivious tutor's display of piety presented in a delicious stew of Yiddish interspersed with cleverly chosen snippets of Losh and Kleidish from various canonical texts achieves the desired effect. Bear in mind, though, that Reb Yosuke is clever enough to be able to reside, at least temporarily, in two linguistic worlds. When he has a pivotal encounter with Yetkin, that, that we'll see in a moment, he rapidly code switches between the language of the yeshiva and the language of the salon. We might call this the second loaded gun. For ultimately, Volson shows us that living in two cultures in the way that Reb Yosef tries to is unsustainable, certainly also undesirable. Between the extremes of frivolous dalliances and mock displays of piety sit the other central characters, Yetchen's parents, Reb Hanoch and Teltze, and her uncle, Teltze's brother, Marcus. We know little about Hanoch's backstory. Clearly, though, he's done very well for himself materially, uh, but never got much of a traditional Jewish education. To try to make sure the same thing doesn't happen to his son, he has reached eastward and hired uh, a Polish tutor. Why not a Prussian one? He doesn't say, but his words and actions suggest that he would find most of them too acculturated, too liberal, well, too much like his brother-in-law, Marcus, a Moscow, if ever there was one. Marcus, at least in many ways, is the play's raison d'oeuvre, the, the man who cautioned against hiring Reb Yosef in the first place, and later gets to say, I told you so, the one who, in a soliloquy delivered late in the play, admonishes parents in the audience, um, and as Jeremy Dauber has pointed out, um, not a single word that Marcus says in the entire play um, comes from Hebrew. It's, it's all either the dramatic component of, you know, of your children, be more watchful of their moral education than their physical education, and teach them early to have an affinity for what is noble and good. Then you will never have to worry about your children's foolishness. Uh, Teltza, Hanok's wife, and Marcus's sister shares her brother's outlook, and one tantalizing detail is that unlike many sets of parents from later Haskalah plays and novels, and for, for that matter, beyond the Haskalah, she says she and her husband tended to have fairly compatible views about child rearing until fairly recently when he fell under the sway of the Polish Hossin. The play, in fact, opens with an increasingly heated argument between husband and wife in which he berates her for being too lax about their children's upbringing, while she argues that the new regimen for them is overly strict and warns him not to marry uh, Yetchen to Reb Yosef. When her brother enters, when Marcus enters, it's no surprise that he takes her side, but what may be surprising is that after uh, Reb Hanuk leaves, Marcus gives Teltze as stern a lecture as he gave his brother-in-law. He says, you really don't see the danger your daughter is in. My heart just aches for her when I see her on the promenade with a swarm of barons, counts, and officers buzzing around her, burying her with smiles. And she accepts it all as the height of sincerity. What is the result? She comes back home every inch the grand dame, fritters away her time on trivial things, neglects what really matters, does not deign to lift a finger around the house, in short, is turning into the most useless creature on God's good earth. And so we see the positions each character represents in the opening scenes of the play. Sounds familiar, no? Some of this at least will ring very loud bells to anyone familiar with Moliere's Tartuffe, one of the great rebukes to religious hypocrisy ever written. Surely Wolfson must have known the play in one form or another, and he, he may have known enough French, but he needn't have, for one German translation was published in Hamburg in, in 1747, and another version, Neu und Frei Idelsetzt, uh, was published in Munich in 1784. To me, the most fascinating thing about Wolfson's version is where he most radically departs from Moliere. This departure, and, and for very quick, like, you know, 
one sentence nutshell description. You know, Tatouf, this, uh, this religious hypocrite, comes in, also um, kind of turns the household upside down, wraps his boss, gets his boss wrapped around his finger, uh, is, is going to get the girl and the gold and all of these things. And actually, Moliere really struggled with the ending, and he wrote a very dark one, which apparently was not going to fly. And he and he put one in with the Deus Ex Machina, and you know, the last minute documents arrive, and and Tartuffe is undone and and, and punished. Um, so you know the, the 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 target there is really is is the hypocrisy. Um, the departure from Moliere here is indicated in the title and, and leads to the scene we're about to read, where Moliere skewered religious hypocrites. Wilson goes after both that issue and more or less its opposite, at least in his world. For although he was a pioneering figure of the Haskalah. Wilson saw danger not only in what he felt was religious extremism and hypocrisy, but also in a complete abandonment of one's religious learning and practice. And again, uh, Shmuel was talking about the 1790s when this was written this morning, and, uh, and, and indeed this ambivalence among uh, masculine of the time um, that, the, uh, you know, that, that things could go too far and that you, you needed uh, you know, this, this balance, and it wasn't all about just sort of moving away from Judaism, it was holding on to whatever you, they, any given Moscow would feel was the, the core of, of Judaism. Uh, Moliere called his play Tartuffe because that character is his protagonist, his villain, and his target. Wolfson places both of his targets up front as well. Um, and, and this is the scene that places both of those on a collision course with each other. Indeed, it's the first moment in the play, it's clear that they, they've been, you know, they're, they're, he's living in the household and they've seen each other, but they really haven't talked because we, we learn from the scene, you know, he's put on this display of piety, and that means that he would probably just look down whenever uh, she went by, and then he would run after the maid instead. I'll make one more point before we read, and if you don't yet know the play and want to test this for yourself, you don't have to take my word for it, then I encourage you to read it in whatever language works for you. Keep in mind, Wolfson was setting out to write arguably the first modern Yiddish drama, and again, as, as Shmuel said, there are uh, two very interesting plays written in that decade, and published in that decade, the 1790s, the, the other one, it's uh, Reichel's Reb Henoch oder Vos Tutmen damit. Just looking at the two of them side by side is really instructive um, because Reb Hanoch is really interesting in lots of ways and there, there are moments that are really funny and it's fascinating. Um, it's a very unwieldy play and characters, you know, someone will say, oh, where have you been lately? Uh, you know, the last few days, no one could find you. And then he'll spend the next three pages explaining everything that happened from that. So it's quite clunky as a play. Um, by contrast, um, Lachlan and Fremli is a very tightly constructed play. Every scene moves play forward. Um, it, it's, it's, very, it's clever in so many ways. It's, it's theatrically interesting. And I would say that even though the, the characters um, clearly represent particular positions, um, there and, and he's, Wolfson, you could say, is more interested in that than in nuanced character development, he actually gives actors quite a lot to work with, and, and you can do you know, some very interesting things with this. And this is a man with really no mentors, certainly in the Yiddish world. He's not a professional playwright, and he couldn't have gone down the road and handed this to the Yiddish company and said, okay, let's, let's workshop this thing. Uh, I mean, he, he certainly could have passed it around in his salon, and, and, and he may well have done so, gotten some feedback, um, but it's really amazing what, what a well-constructed play uh, he created, really sort of right off the bat uh, as one of the first modern uh, Yiddish plays. Um, so, quickly to set the scene, um, shortly before this, this moment, um, Red Yosef, as I said, has planted the suggestion that he'd given Yefren's hand in marriage, um, and, well, and he wants to make it look to Reb Hanach like it was his idea all along, so Reb Hanach uh, consents to that. And back in Yefren's parlor, um, her sharp tongued maid, because you need, you know, an 18th century drama, you need a sharp tongued maid um, who uh, says, Oh, uh, guess what? You're about to have a visitor. And she's quite amused by this because it's none other than Reb Yosef. Uh, and Shandel thinks this is kind of funny. And, Reb Ye and, and Yefren is fairly surprised that this is going to happen. Um, and so that, that's sort of the moment where, that we're about to come to. Um, this, this was not a, a play that was performed professionally, um, but certainly there, there are some 
at least suggested costumes here, and I see that um, Shmuel is, has an interesting uh, uh, reckle uh, on. Uh, and uh, so imagine, you know, forget that I, I would not be this clean shaven as Rav Yosef has, or Shmuel's beard is really more appropriate, maybe should even be bushier. Uh, there would be, uh, you know, some kind of a more traditional uh, garb, uh, presumably it's like a black suit and a white shirt, and uh, I, I will put on a, a yarmulke, so at least we'll have a little flavor of that. Uh, and uh, there's a reference to powder that Yefin would, maybe it's a powdered wig, maybe it's also, you know, powdery uh, makeup, but, but she would have that. Um, you'll see, we'll, we'll be uh, pantomiming a piano. Um, and um, I, I think the one other thing to say right now before we jump in is that Nam and I in particular, because we're reading the, the highly Germanized Yiddish, um, Please forgive, you know, all lovers of the German language, uh, forgive us. Uh, we're really not, you know, we're not trying to do a Monty Python routine. It's a very <laughs> peculiar, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe Monty Python should be the people who do this play, but um, it's, it's a peculiar Yiddish uh, that, that's, and German that's in the play, and it's not entirely clear, at least to us and other people that we've talked to, you know, how all of these things would be uh, pronounced. So it, it's, um, we're just, just imagine there's some interesting dialect that, Wolfson encountered on his travels. Huh? But the, um, it's also, you, um, well, there's a, a translation. In yes, the please. Oh, yes. Everyone, Thank you for If you don't need the translation into English, is in the back of your program. Your composer booklets, if you don't know. And you don't talk about anything about that she's from the German, but how she's different from Sarah, and we'll talk about that after. Um, yeah, we can talk about a few things after because I'd like to also say, you know, sort of say a few things about where the play ends up going, and then we can talk about various other uh, issues. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I did find myself thinking this morning as various people were talking that I, I, I felt like we almost crowdsourced the introduction to this play already because it really, uh, very interestingly, ties together so many of the issues. I had this sort of law, you know, whole page of notes. So here are the themes that, that are really central to the play. So I think there'll be some things to talk about. So um, we will hear it in uh, uh, appropriately Russian Kleidish first, uh, and then we'll turn to the Yiddish. One remark, we are going to uh, read it in the Hebrew version because uh, we are lucky and uh, actually Aaron Wolfson, the author, he wrote in Hebrew and Yiddish German version. Of course, Hebrew was not a spoken language uh, at the time, so that we all know it. Um, so, I'm at Yostri and Yetran is over there. <laughs> ספרה טובה, ספרה, כך בזריזות. ברוך הבא. יושב נא. אסור לי, כי אם אעשה זאת, חזיר ימס, בוא נדבר. מה זאת? הגם שיש ביכולתי לקח לכיסא, אף גם זאת אעשה להטריח. רכה וענוגה אשר לא נסתה כף רגלה עצק על הארץ. האם אני מפריע אותה ממעשיה? אל ניפול ליבו על זה. אני שוחקת אתה, אך בדברים קטנים. כך, היא שוחקת. יפה הדבר, בחיי ראשי, טוב. הגם הרבי אוהב מוזיק? בבירור, אשים נפשי בכפי, אך לשמוע מוזיק. ולא יערב לנפשי אכול ושתו אם אשמע כל שיר וזמר. על אחת כמה, כאשר היא מנגנת, תאמין לי כי פעמים הייתי עומד אחורי כותלי ביתה זמן ארוך לשמוע מפיה כל שיר. ידעתי זאת, אז היטבתי שיר, הרבתי נגן. מה הבאת? כי אלה מרום הרים. האם לא אוכל לבקש ממנה? שתמחול לשיר גם אתה מעט, כי קולה ערב לי מאוד. לשורר אין בכלתי לקראת, כי גרוני מיכל, אבל לכבודו אין הגן לו דבר מה. אך 
האם צר לו המקום אשר ניגש אליי? ואל חיכי ישב? גם הנה הרבי, כי הלבין הדרתו, באבקת רוחל ענפל מסערות ראשי ארצה. האם אינו רואה זאת? אין זה מזיק. מצפירה תפרה כמוה, יוכל כל אדם להתאבק ולהתאפר, כי הפרות זהב לה. מה הוא אומר לניגון הזה, אשר ישמעתי הוא? הישר הוא בעיניו? הישר הוא? השם יאריך ימיה ושנותיה. מימיי לא ראיתי ולא שמעתי, מכלילת יופי משוש כל הארץ, כאשר עיניי רואות עתה. כלו כליותיי מחבחיקי, מרוב מועצות אשר שמתי בנפשי, להבין במראה אשר ראיתי. כי תלמד ידה לקרב את צבעותיה למלחמת מיתרי העוגב, ובערב קין ירוצו ויכוננו חיציהם על יתר זה, ושאריתם על יתר אחר, את תשמיע נעימות בימינה נצח. והם הדקים מאוד, ומשמן בשרם רז, והכל זה כוח להם לעמוד בכל אלה, וירוצו ולא ייגעו, ילכו ולא יאבו. מה טוב הוא אם רב, אבל יאמר נא לי, מה נכבד היום הזה, והיגלות נגלות הרבי לעיניי כאחד העם, אשר אנוכי יושבת בקרבו, ומה נאה על ככה? Mm, רעות פניה פיללתי, כי אימה אכבדה מעשות זאת כמו שכן טוב, ולקחת לנפשי הכבוד הזה. אבל האמנתי כי הוא לא יוכל להביט בפני נשים. Mm, רעות במו יכול אוכל, אבל... אין רצוני. לזאת אתן שמחה בליבי, כי הבדל הבדילני מנשים אחרות. אבל למה יעתל בי ולא יגיד לי כל ליבו, על מה בא אל ביתי היום הזה ולא מתמול שלשום, או מאז בא בביתנו? באמת דבר זה בכה רצוף טעם נכון. האם לא הורשיתי לידה כי לנפשי אותה לדעת רוצה הדבר? למה לא? אני אומר לה, אתמול, אנוכי, האם לא דיבר אביה עם הדבר? האם לא הגיד לה? אבי לא דיבר, ומה יש לו לאבי להגיד? כל ההתחלות קשות, אבל הורה לה הדרך. תגיד נא לי, אבל באמת ובתמיד, מכירות ליבה, האם רצונה לעשות שידוך? השאלה הזאת ביקשה לשאול. האם הוא מצא לי איש כלבבי? אני ואביה מצאנו לה איש כלבבה, וכמעט הוא כלאחר מעשה. גם בקרוב יכתוב התנאים בקנס, ויכול להיות עוד היום הזה, אם ירצה השם. איך אוכל להאמין את זה? אבי באמת לא ייתן אותי לאיש בלתי שאלת פי ובלתי שמוע רצוני. מי הוא האיש הזה? הלא מחוכמת היא מאוד, ולמה לא תדע זאת? חוטי נא אך הפעם. ואיך החוט הזאת? רבו אנשים על פני הארץ. נא, יאמר לי, מה שמו? המשומדת הזאת, נפשה יודעת מאוד מהדבר הזה, אך תעשה שקר בנפשי. האם אינה יודעת מי הוא? אך רצונה לשמוע ממני? והנה אגיד לה, אני הוא, אני ולא אחר. אם הוא מנת חלקי בכוסי, התומך גורלי, אגילה וסחבו. אה, באמת? כה יחיה. כי גם אביה הגיד לי כי היא נפש טובה. השם ייתן לנו אך מזל וברכה, ועוד נחיה בחיים ערבים. תאמין לי, אינני רוצה להתפאר עליה. ידעתי ברוך השם לראות חיים עם האישה אשר אהבתי, הגן כי הכרת פניי ענתה בי כגבר חלש. אבל עוד כוחי במותניי, ועוני בשירי בטני, אכפוץ זנבי כמו ארז. די פחדי יסוגו, וכאיש גבורה לבוא עליה כדרך כל הארץ. והיא מעט, והוסיף עליה כהנה וכהנה, את תשלח כצאן אביליה וילדיה ירקדום. ומה תגדל השמחה בלב אביה, וערוץ המהר להגיד לו, כי אשתו יבשר טוב וגיל יגיל, אבי צדקת כמוה. מזל טוב, מזל טוב. מה מאוד אהיז פניו? האם לא חיתולי ממדי? ירף ממני בדברים כאלה, ואם לא, הרי הוא הביטח. מה זאת? האם תדמה בנפשה כי אני מהתל בה? בחיי נפשי, כי באמת דיברתי דבריי. כי איך אעשה הרעה הגדולה הזאת? לשום כבודה משחק לי? אך אביה אמר, ותהי, ומה רצונה יותר? 
הנני אומרת לו הפעם החלום שיקפוץ פיו מתווה. פן אשליך אותו מחדרי ובוז וכלו נמצא, וחלפתו לא תימחה. איך שיכור וחזיר היעד הזה יעז פניו לדבר אליי כדברים האלה? מה? אנוכי איש שוקה שיכור? אני? לולא פני אביה אני נושא, אז יירתיע עם אנוכי שיכור. אבל טוב הדבר, קטר לי זה עיר ואחרת. בזו הרגע אני הולך אל אביה, ובעל כורחה תנסה לי. בעל כורחה אני אומר, בעל כורחה. למעני ילך לעזאזל, האם הוא או אבי ילחצוני להיות אישה לאיש אשר אינני חפיצה בו? מימיי לא ראיתי חצופה כזאת. אביה, אין בכוחו ללחוץ אותה. האם אביה? היה כבודה. חצופה היא. לו הייתה נפשי תחת נפש אביה, אז הייתי לא חוצה שתינשא לי, הגם שלא ברצונה. אוי, מן השמיים ירחמו, וגבי מחמד עיניי, איך ניפוץ ככלי יוצר. Ich 
Hat er nicht Taten gar nicht mit dir geschmust? Da hat er noch nicht gesagt. Mein Vater? Nicht ein Wort? Was soll der mir denn sagen? Oh, was voll des Kasches. Ich muss sagen, ihr wollt der Derbisch zu sein. Also, gib mir mal eure ganze Kirche Leben. Macht sie gerne das Schilderton? Das ist eine gewisse Frage. Wissen Sie denn eine Partie für mich? Ihr wollt ihr taten, dass Azair geht mit Schilder vor ihr und es ist schon so viel, als der Achtel Meister, es wird auch bald knass gelegt werden, er schon noch heim zu schicken. Das scheint mir unmöglich zu sein. Mein Vater wird mich wahrlich nicht verheiraten, ohne meine Meinung ein Willen erst zu vernehmen. Wer soll sehen, wenn wir diesem Mensch sein? Sie ist unbeschrieben, so ja hoffen und soll es nicht wissen, und sie ja nicht. Wie soll ich raten? Wie soll ich raten? Es gibt ja viele Mannsleute in der Welt. Nennen Sie ihn mir doch. Sie ist so im Schmiedeste, dass Sie es nur so verstellt. Warum Sie weiß es nicht? Sie will es nur von mir reden. Nun, ich will es ihr an äh, Acht sorgen. Ich bin Ihr Hoffnung. Wenn Sie es sind, so kann ich wohl zufrieden sein. Alles? Soll ich leben, ihr Taten hat mir auch gesagt, dass es ein Hoschef Kind. Hashem Jesporech schenkt uns noch Mazel und Broche. Wir wollen wir schon ein Sinnes der Leben. Leben Sie mir. Ich will mir nicht mehr Spar sein. Ich weiß, bei Hashem mit der Frau fertig zu werden. Was wird der Taten für ein Sinn gehoben? Ich will euch gleich runtergehen und ihm sagen, was er so für ein Nefesh Teufel hat von einem Kind. Nu, nu, Mazel drauf, Mazel drauf! Sie werden sehr dreist. Mit solchen Spessen bleiben Sie mir von hart. Oder ich zeige Ihnen die Tür. Was ist das? Sie meint, Escher, ich mache doch nicht alles? Bechai, Roshi, Bechai, Nashi, es ist kein Gefolgs. Was teilt ihr? Ich werde mir mit dir etwas nutzen? Was denkt sie für Narrigkeit? Der Taten hat es gesorgt. Was will sie meinen? Oder? Ich sage Ihnen nun zum letzten Mal, entfernen Sie sich oder ich lasse Sie aus meinem Zimmer hinauswerfen. Was das für Dreistigkeiten sind von so einem besoffenen polnischen Schwein. Was? <lacht> ich bin ein schicker Säufer. Ich möchte mich nicht einer Tat ins Kopf scheiden. Ich will ein Wahnsinn haben, wenn ich ein schicker Säufer bin. Aber es ist schon gut. Warten wir uns schon gut. Für so eine Regel geht bei der Tat und ihr seid sehen. Well, koch is up in the heaven. Well, koch is up in the heaven. Geht ihr meine Wegen zum Teufel? Weder ihr noch mein Vater werden mich zu einer Heirat zwingen können. Was das war ein Zufall? Ihr Taten können ihr sie zwingen. So ist auch noch kein Regen von Taten. Viel und ihr werdet nicht ein Zufall. Wenn ich ihr Taten, ich werde auch schon wasen. Ihr sollt mich miesen nennen und wenn ihr da tausendmal nahen sollt. Dass ich Gott erbarme, mein schönes Klavier ist ganz verputzt. <lacht> So, um, we, we get all my, my fellow actors. Um, it's fun to work with uh, my, my mentor and fellow translator and historian, Nama, and, uh, and to hear the Hebrew. Um, so, I, there's a lot to talk about here. I'll, I'll point to a couple things and also say where this is going, and maybe we can uh, talk a bit. Um, 
the, uh, you know, one, of, one of the things that's really amazing about this scene, I think, is you, know, you can see the emotional arc here. Uh, and, and here's a guy, to her great surprise, walks in and you know, he's never made eye contact before, and all of a sudden, he can speak the language of the Salon, and he does all the sort of thing. And I think it, it's so, I mean, Nam and I were talking about this when we were trying to sort of figure out how to pitch things. Um, I, my feeling is that, that she is just so kind of, once, once this kicks in, she kind of goes on autopilot, and the guy is sort of interchangeable up to a point, you know? She, he sort of does the language, and so she does her thing. It's almost like a dance, you know? And he, he it is a kind of dance. Um, and so, you know, he does that, and by, you know, he really turns on a dime at a certain moment, of course, um, everything reverses when that, that, that sort of uh, salon flirtation uh, unravels when they start to realize they're speaking past each other. Of course, you know, that moment, I mean, I, I kept looking up at the beautiful harpsichord last night and think, you know, imagine like that, uh, you know, I'm glad we didn't uh, smash it, um, but if that's sort of the thing that's being smashed, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, and Christoph actually um, mentioned something about a manufacturer, a manufacturer of these things, and um, I'd like to talk to you about that maybe during this discussion. You know, I was thinking about what something like this would have cost relative to the, you know, income of either a wealthy household or an average household. Clearly not, uh, you know, this isn't an inexpensive item, no. right? And so there's the damage to that. And of course, if he can do that sort of violence to this beautiful object and to everything that it represents with so little provocation, what other sort of terrible things is he uh, capable of? So the, the dramatic events are now set in motion, um, starting with loaded gun number one, which if you remember is Yetkin's sort of excessive love of German culture, and it's sort of the wrong, you know, it's, she loves sort of the wrong things or some of the right things in the wrong way. You know, she's not a Sarah Levy. She's not, uh, she, she's not a patroness of the arts. It's, it's a, the sort of low and middle brow stuff, and, uh, and it's all about surfaces. And so she runs off into the arms of a suitor, um, von Schnapps is his name, uh, and uh, we, we never met him either, but, we, but there's a love letter from him that's read during the play, which is quite fun. Um, and um, just like that, he sells her off to a brothel, as a Gentile obviously would, of course, right? So, um, you know, he betrays her immediately, and she ends up being sold off to a brothel. Don't worry, of course, she's not going to be touched. Marcus, the, the muscular people, um, tracks her down and, and helps find her in time. Um, and brings, you know, this is one of the great things too. So Marcus goes to the brothel, he finds her, she hasn't been with a man yet, and so instead of those saying, okay, niece, let's get the hell out of here, uh, he says, um, he goes to the madam and he says, I'm gonna pay for the services of this young lady for the evening, and he says to his niece, sit tight, I'll be back. Uh, so ever the ever the didact, you know, he's going. This is a teachable moment for him. Uh, so he's going to go and bring his brother-in-law to show him. It wouldn't be good enough to tell him what happened. He wants his brother-in-law to see on the spot. I mean, I guess that's good pedagogy, actually. It's maybe not good unclehood, but it's you know good pedagogy. He wants to see it in her, see her in the environment, so he brings her back. Now, remember, loaded gun number two, as I set up, was. Um, was uh, Rabbi Yosef's manipulation of language. And here's one of the great strokes that, uh, that, that uh, Wilson introduced. So when, uh, when they come back, or while, while they're away actually, when, when Marcus goes out and Yetham is in some back room, which he's safe, and who should come in but Rabbi Yosef, who first of all is, we learn, a regular patron of the brothel. Um, to make matters worse, um, he hasn't been paying cash. He's opened up a line of credit. He's opened up a tab there, saying to the madam, my ship's about to come in. I'm marrying into this wealthy family. Um, he's actually pawned his tefillin uh, as uh, so, 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 like, couldn't, you know, Wilson couldn't have thought of more things to pile on top to make this any worse. Um, so, so there he is. Um, and of course, at that moment, um, his, his boss, Reb Hena, uh, and, and Marcus come back in, and uh, Reb Yosef ducks underneath the table, and then the really beautiful thing, or one of the beautiful things that Wilson does uh, towards the end, is that in that last scene, um, Reb Yosef goes mute. He sort of goes into shock, and he's unable to speak 
for the rest of the play. So this man who has used language in such nefarious ways uh, now loses the ability uh, to use language. And, and quite wonderfully, actually, it's, it's the, the madam, it's the brothel keeper uh, who has the last words. Um, Reb, uh, Reb Hanok says to, uh, to, to Marcus and, and yeah, you know, let's bring you back. Your mother's worried about you. You know, let's, let's get back there. They leave, um, and then uh, oh, and and they've said to they've also paid the madam to sort of keep uh, you know sort of look after Reb Yosef for the night, and they'll deal with him tomorrow. Um, so she says to Reb Yosef at the very end, well, I'm not keeping you inside the house now, uh, and she marches on like literally to the doghouse. Uh, and, and she has the last word uh, of the play, you know, mar march, march, you know, out into the, uh, in, into the back. And, and that's the end of, of the play. So this is how uh, Wilson ties all of these threads together. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's sort of where, where this goes. I'm interested for people to, you know, questions, comments, and not just for me, but for also anyone else who, who read. Just to follow up on what you, you're saying about the, his, his sudden muteness, Yosef's muteness at the end, that seems to sort of echo. I mean, he's, he's asking his intended to sing for him, which mm -hmm. is potentially problematic if, for, in his religious world. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end, smashes the instrument that she does want to play. Mm -hmm. uh, that it seems to me that there's, there are resonances in the musical language yeah. that's being alluded to, as well as in, you know, with these sort of ideas of sound and mm -hmm. silence. Yeah. On, sort of piled on top of the linguistic right. issues that you're raising. Right, absolutely. And of course, he shouldn't have been in the room alone with her to begin with. Uh, if, if he were that religious, and he manages to persuade uh, Reb Hanach that it's really okay. He, he also twists some, uh, some verses and, and you know, says it's okay for me to be alone with him. Hi. Um, so given some of the topics of the uh, symposium, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the aspects of Salon culture that are represented in the play and what forms of the sort of entertainment are, mm -hmm. are addressed. What, what forms of entertainment? Salon. Uh, yeah, well, you know, of course there's, there's the, um, you know, there, there's the, the music that she plays. Um, we, we see references to her going off to the opera. There's a specific opera, Oberon, that is mentioned. Uh, and um, there's, you know, she's going to meet uh, a suitor at the opera. Um, there are sort of, you know, there are, I don't know if to call this entertainment, but there's sort of walks on the promenade. There's this whole sort of, um, world of, of courtship and things that, that she did. And again, there's, you know, the references to, um, someone talks about, well, so-and-so, you know, their family is openly anti-Semitic, but that doesn't, it really, Judaism seems to matter so little to her um, that that doesn't seem to face her at all. Um, there's a moment when she um, comes back to her room um, and she's looking for something to do and she pulls a, a, a book off the shelf and she so it says, you know, she starts to read it and says, you know, I'm, I'm really bored with this. And basically, like, I'm kind of bored with all of the, the reading. So she has all of these sort of trappings of, uh, of culture and, and entertainment, but none of them seem to really mean anything much to her. I have a question, I guess, for Shmuel. Why do you think um, he wrote it in Hebrew? Um, I'm not sure. Long, uh, okay. um, <laughs> Give the short version. And why you read it? The Hebrew is different from the Yiddish. There was there was stuff in the Hebrew that's yeah, not yeah. In the, the, the Hebrew seems longer. So, yeah. Some of the dialogue seems longer in Hebrew. Do you have any yeah. thoughts? Just quick thoughts about it. Um, we think that the Hebrew is the original, is and the then came oh, really? uh, the, the Yiddish and, and German. Uh, for him, it was like a Louder, a realistic replacement for the poem, for the poem spiel. Yeah, that's um, yeah, there's an introduction. Um, this introduction to the, to the play by Aaron Wolfson, who was a teacher in one of the modern, first modern Jewish uh, schools, and actually he, he says that uh, usually on Purim we, uh, you know, we stage the, the Purim spiel, 
but uh, this doesn't have any connection to real life. And now I'm going to give you something to replace in order to perform it in, in improving, but this is about real life. That's about the problems that we are facing today. And it's really something that uh, very typical to the masculine. They wanted to present the uh, audience with problems and, and give them uh, solutions. And uh, according to his interpretation, the Jewish family is a big crisis uh, today um, from different uh, perspectives. We spoke about it uh, this morning from uh, the perspective of the parents who are too ignorant and they still uh, invite uh, um, tutors from Poland. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, these girls uh, were too modern, actually modern in the wrong way because they, uh, they didn't uh, follow the instruction of the masculine, but uh, a different way of culturation leading towards, uh, uh, towards assimilation. So uh, Hebrew was the, the language of the, of the masculine, and Bolson did uh, other pieces, actually, uh, in, uh, in, in Hebrew. Um, he actually uh, also um, um, wrote another play in Hebrew, um, so it's considered a play, considered a satire, <coughs> Sicha Beretz Achaim, it was published in, uh, in, in a Merse. So Hebrew was his first language. So I think that the question is why it was translated into Yiddish. So maybe we don't have any evidence. Maybe uh, um, they, they try to, uh, to put it on stage uh, in, in Purim, in, in certain uh, circle or private uh, house. We, we don't know that about it. It was printed, both editions were, both editions were printed. Um, the Hebrew is a manuscript. The Hebrew is a, is, is a manuscript, the, the Yiddish was... Uh, and then the Yiddish was, was printed and actually went into a second. Yeah, but for those who are interested in the history of theater, it was staged once in Israel, and um, Israeli producer Yossi uh, Israeli. Uh, I was then uh, a teenager, and I attended this uh, play just by chance, and I didn't realize at all uh, what it's all about, what is the historical context, because it was, uh, um, it was put on stage uh, on the style of the um, comedy de, de la Arte, um, something really, really beautiful, but since then it was never staged. Uh, and I really hope that someday, somewhere, there will be an opportunity uh, uh, to, to play the entire um, the play, and this and the other one by uh, Isaac Oichel. It, it's, um, well, it's important um, Jewish cultural heritage, something that uh, we, most of us don't know much about. Could, I, I want to add something to that, that there was salon culture of a different kind in Eastern Europe, in Yiddish, um, the, among Maskilim in, in Eastern Europe, who were speaking at that time Yiddish, and their, their language, although German was the language of Haskala for them, still they spoke Yiddish, and they read Yiddish plays including this. Well, the part of uh, Yetzin, is actually in German, but it was written in, in Hebrew letters. Yes. But, it, but, but clearly looks as though it's, I mean, you, it reads as though it's German. With occasional oif instead of auf. Mm. But auf, auf would have been pronounced auf anyway. Where was it published? Auf, auf, auf. Which place? Published, I don't remember, do you remember, Aaron Wolfson was at the time a teacher uh, in Breslau. Breslau, okay. Yeah, Breslau. I'm not sure if it was printed there, but probably it was composed there. Uh, and and um, uh, the other play was uh, um, written in Berlin by, by Isaac Oichal, almost simultaneously. Do we know of Yiddish theaters in Breslau or in Berlin at the time? No. They're, they're, and, you know, I would find it hard to imagine that the families of the court Jews would attend mm -hmm. uh, a Yiddish theater. I think it was not their yeah. environment. No, the, and there, there actually, there are no, you know, there are no professional Yiddish theaters anywhere at this point. The Yiddish theater is, uh, it, it, depending on how you define theater, I mean, you can talk about other kinds of performances sure. like Bad Khanim and things like that, but if you talk about- No, I don't think of it as a building yeah. or so, but, but well, not even place no, to no uh, perform. companies or anything like that, except for people doing- No, no, no. no.
you know, yeah, I mean, oh, they, sort of, yeah, you know, 1800 or so. Mm -hmm. um, it's not until there, there are some sporadic efforts to get professional Yiddish theater started earlier, but really dated to the 1870s in Romania uh, when the professional Yiddish theater is born. So, but, but then before that, you've got uh, three quarters of a century of Moskilic drama, uh, some of which is being published, some of which is just circulating, some of which, like Ettinger Serkela, uh, is, cir circulates, and then I think it was first published in Johannesburg or something, you know, so not, not a place where Ettinger was hanging out. Uh, so, you know, the, these texts have, a, and, and certainly a lot of these texts are lost as well, you know, that were just uh, never published. I should say, uh, just to, to make this clear also, that um, not only was were, were Wolfson and, and Eichel first, but they're very influential. I mean, really, they 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 kind of they really lay the foundation. The the other Moskilic writers, and I would even say later writers to a certain extent, come back to a lot of the things. For example, this the opening scene where it's not when we read but the opening scene where the husband and wife are arguing. Um, almost the same argument uh, at the beginning of the two Kuni Lamas, which Lama has adopted and Jeremy and I have translated, you know, which is, which you might say is almost like the last play of the Haskalah, depending on when you date the end of the Haskalah, but it's very much in that, in that spirit, around 1880, 1881. Um, so, you know, almost a century later, um, people are going back and a lot of, and things like particularly the, that, that um, trope of the, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of false embrace of uh, of uh, German culture, of high culture, um, that you know we see a character like Yetchen pop up in play after play after play, and playwrights have a lot of fun with this sort of thing because often, I mean, they um, it's not even done that much with Yetchen, but other other writers like like Schleimer, I think, are a few decades later in Poland will make that sort of character really, really, you know, incredible, just, she's just the butt of lots of jokes. Actually, she and her mother were both kind of similarly em embracing all of the wrong things. So a lot of the things that Wilson's doing will, will you know, keep resonating for decades. Um, what, no, what I want to say is that we need to move on to the larger discussion, but we can, it will give us opportunity to weave in questions that we have about what we just heard. But um, some people yeah. have to leave at five points. So I want to invite Christoph to take the mic. Yeah. And if people can bring closer, we're just going to have a sort of a closing conversation, not privileging any topic except topics all related to what you've heard today. And so um, please come. I'm supposed to uh, chair or moderate a round table of some 15 participants. Uh, this is kind of unrealistic. First of all, we do not have a round table. We have a rectangular table, but we have uh, a semicircular setup uh, here. So I would suggest uh, we treat this uh, concluding session as a, uh, an open general discussion. Open mic, open mic. And I, I have mics. I oh, will that's bring great. Them, I'll bring them Wonderful. to you. So, uh, whenever you have a question, uh, please um, ask for a mic so that you will be heard. Uh, this room is a bit out of proportion with respect to the size of um, our group, but still, I think uh, we should be able to conduct a, uh, a discussion. Um, I must say, I attended a wonderful conference and a great concert uh, last night, and I think the uh, uh, quality of a conference can be measured by the questions that remain unanswered. <laughs> and uh, I think there are lots of questions that will perhaps stimulate further research. Of course, we did not have much time for questions uh, particularly in the morning. Uh, so there may be some questions you want to put to some of the uh, presenters. I think of Liliane, if she's still here. Okay. So I think uh, there are a number of uh, uh, open uh, questions that uh, are, I think, worth uh, pursuing. If I think of um, what I heard in this last session, which I think opened up broader uh, perspectives, and we uh, had in uh, uh, the uh, uh, paper uh, earlier this morning, 
uh, a similar approach to the aesthetics of the uh, um, Berlin uh, period of the old regime when it came to music and art. And uh, Moses Mendelssohn was, of course, a key uh, figure. Uh, when I think of uh, the um, uh, texts we uh, looked at, uh, we also need to perhaps look into the sources uh, that Moses Mendelssohn uh, made use of. And uh, from what I imagine is he was a widely read um, uh, scholar. Uh, he used a lot of traditional views, which he then put together in an impressive uh, system of uh, philosophical thoughts on uh, aesthetics. But for example, uh, the um, issue of uh, Moshe taking the uh, Torah uh, sung to him by God, you know, sounds to me like um, Gregory uh, listening to the Holy Spirit for the uh, uh, Gregorian chant. Uh, so this is an image that is not uh, specific to uh, Judaism, nor is the issue of uh, music as medicine. Uh, I've seen uh, inscriptions on harpsichords and organs, uh, musica, uh, medicina uh, animae, uh, that is, music is the medicine of the soul. Uh, and then uh, the Lutheran uh, concept of uh, enhancing the words through music, and it's for this reason that he uh, um, eliminated the gradual from the uh, uh, service and replaced it by uh, a motet to emphasize the central verse of the uh, gospel reading uh, because he thought that uh, the reading would just uh, speak to the intellect uh, and not to the heart and the music would make sure uh, that uh, the message would sink in. So there are uh, deep roots uh, in uh, these uh, philosophical thoughts of the 18th century that one might um, want to uh, pursue uh, further. And as far as um, hidden antisemitism is concerned, if we think of the fact that Mendelssohn, who was trained by Zelter to be successor as director of the Singh Academy, and then the board of directors picked Guggenhagen. And Mendelssohn himself, as far as we can tell, uh, was kind of relieved because he was only 20 years old. But the Mendelssohn family considered this as a slap in the face and as an anti-Semitic act. So things are complex and I think it is uh, very important that all these things are brought out in the open. And so uh, I didn't mean to uh, in any way try wrapping it up, uh, but my intention on the contrary is to open up further avenues of research. And I'm thinking in particular uh, that there may be quite a number of questions related specifically to Sarah Levy, who got lost a little bit uh, uh, in the uh, afternoon. We have a, well, sorry, a question right here. Okay. Um, yeah. This isn't unfortunately about Sarah Levy, <laughs> but uh, just as a footnote to what you were saying, uh, one thing that uh, I was thinking about when we were hearing about uh, Moses Mendelssohn uh, and his attitude towards the fact that it was very important that the words have music I was thinking then about ancient Greece, and uh, is it not Aristotle who says, you know, uh, that uh, song, right? you know, and uh, that was that's one time. So the question is, and I don't know the answer, uh, to what extent was Mendelssohn's thought influenced in any way by ancient Greek sure. thought? Now, that's number one. Uh, the second is a comment, and I uh, spoke with uh, Professor Helfer about this afterwards. I, for me, Lessing is a real hero, so I listened with great care. Uh, uh, not concern necessarily, but it, but I found it very interesting. Uh, but I would like to, to only take issue with your final statement, 
um, as I told her earlier, uh, and that is that uh, where she saw the uh, like the Juden as a continuation of the some of the traditions of anti-Semitism in the church. I think most uh, uh, scholars would agree that it actually marks a new uh, a beginning where for the first time in, in uh, German literature and maybe European literature, I'm not sure, uh, Jews are depicted in a positive way. Uh, and uh, so in a sense, it went, yes, one can see those things that she was talking about, but I, there is a kind of revolutionary aspect to the union uh, uh, that um, I think is important to, to underscore. You want to reply? Um, I actually did reply. <laughs> I did reply uh, during the break that I agree. But only privately. Yeah. But privately. only privately that I agree entirely with that. I, uh, I, my, I'm completely convinced that Lessing's intent is to open up a conversation, one in which the Jews are presented to a predominantly Christian audience in a positive light. But at the same time, my point is that one must not overlook the troubled and problematic way in which he does this, and in which this rhetoric subconsciously or unconsciously enters into mainstream thought about Jews and Judaism in German culture. So I agree entirely that there is something revolutionary going on here, but I'm suggesting that it is more troubled and more problematic than we, than we have really accounted for up until this point in the scholarship. Thank you. Uh, yeah? Well, I wanted to make a connection between... Uh, uh, it, it, Just wait a minute. Mike is coming. I want to thank Nancy and Rebecca for, especially for including the play, which was just remarkable. I've been hearing about it for years. So this is a, a, an attempt to connect Yevgen to Sarah Levy, and especially to Natalie's paper, and to a kind of debate I saw between the two Barilan academics, between Natalie's perspective and Schwul's perspective, and that is that if Wolfson sees Yevgen as a dilettante and frivolous and not serious, and I thought the point of Natalie's paper was to kind of render Sarah Levy as a, as a maskila. I think an interesting conversation that I would love to hear is whether at the end of this day, and as, from whatever we know about Sarah Levy, we should see her more as a philanthropist with musical interests or more as, as a maskila. That's the first question. The second question, and I'm sorry Liliana had to leave, um, has to do with Fanny Hensel. And it has to do with a contrast for women's roles in music between being in a court aristocratic ambiance and being in a bourgeois um, performance ambiance. I have this rage against Avram Mendelssohn, and I don't know what role his wife Leah played in this, of not letting Fanny Hensel perform. And her relationship with Felix is so vexed over her jealousy and the fact that she's relegated to the salon, which is a little bit public, but made, well, it's public on their parents' tab, is so disturbing that we cannot see that Sarah Levy artistically gave birth to Fanny Hensel. Yet, it would be nice if we could see it that way because it would be the involvement of Jewish women in music. But we can't because Avra Mendelssohn considers it embarrassing to have his daughter perform publicly. And I see that as a tremendous, tremendous tragedy. And I just throw that open for conversation. Mm -hmm. You want to reply? Mm -hmm. okay. I will answer shortly. It's late and we're all tired. <laughs> I don't think I have to choose if I see her either as a masquila or as a philanthropist and whatever. I think I also showed how through philanthropy she was also acting, implementing her own ideas and her ideology. For instance, a, with the example of a Jewish education, she was a philanthropist, but she was also active, even a, determining the curriculum of a, the school she was involved in. So she was both a philanthropist and a, and a masquila, I think she was. Uh, I'm wondering if the real problem that Lessing ran into is that religion and reason are really two entirely separate systems of looking at the world that can't realistically be reconciled. One, one might even think that music is yet another uh, entirely separate system of looking at the world. Anybody want? <laughs> 
I just have a question of, of, of fact. Uh, was Yiddish spoken in Germany? Mm -hmm. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Until, uh, you know, the first half of the, uh, or first third of the uh, it's still uh, 20th century. Yeah. No, the, first the 20th century. Yeah. Is this on? I think that, um, in some ways, the overarching problem is still the overarching problem, which is the distinct distinction that Yaakov Katz, the late Yaakov Katz made. In his first works, he talked about a neutral society of late 18th century Berlin. And then he qualified that and called it a semi-neutral society, taking into account um, the kind of thinking and insights that Martha has brought and that other people have noticed that there is both a new vision of the Jew, certainly a change from the late 18th, 17th through the 18th century, and yet there is still ambivalence about certain qualities that the Jews have, certain traits they seem to have, and then the question always is, is whether or not those traits are due to Judaism or not. And this is, a, is an ongoing tension, and Eli has left, but what, the question I would have asked him about Mendelssohn, because his take on Mendelssohn, which in some ways I think is indebted to some work that David Sorkin, who's not here, has also suggested. If, in fact, Mendelssohn, the iconic figure of acceptance in the Christian realm as a philosopher, is still writing polemics, ultimately, or apologetics, is the vision of religious toleration merely an aspiration, but in fact is on some level an impossibility, meaning can the society of late 18th century Berlin ever be truly neutral? Can there really be toleration of the three great monotheisms, if you will, let's forget the Eastern religions, and can you still then have a truth claim about your own tradition? And I have no answers to this, but this is why the Enlightenment remains, to me, still such an important topic, because those of us in the West live with these questions. To some extent, it's a topic in the 21st century. <laughs> so, um, is it still on? On, on a related note, um, so from my perspective, I feel like I can't let this group of people um, disperse without asking the following question. We've heard a lot today, and thank you all for um, all the enlightening papers. We've heard a lot today about attitudes of Jews towards non-Jews, um, non-Jews towards Jews, um, issues of tolerance and issues of education and enlightenment. I feel like the characters that have been missing from the discussion so far today are the Bachs themselves. Um, there's been a lot, obviously, and a lot of work is ongoing. There has been a lot written and there will be more written about the attitudes of Johann Sebastian to Jews. Um, uh, and idea, you know, ideas of anti-Judaism expressed in his music in various ways, and these issues are hotly debated. Um, but for me, this has always been a, a you know, something that I, I struggle with as a music lover, right? Um, and as a great admirer of the music of the Bach family. Um, I just wonder if anybody would like to comment at all on sort of how, how this remarkable had this remarkable um, series of accidents or whatever happened that, that enabled Sara Levy to have what seems to be more than simply a sort of mercantile or um, convenient relationship with Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, that they, they seem to have spent a lot of time together and really, I, I dare I say, cultivated a friendship? I don't know. Um, it seems to me just more, more than mere um, economic uh, considerations at stake. And I'm, I'm just wondering what happened? You know, I, I understand obviously that there are major issues in enlightenment philosophy and so on, but um, that this has been one of the major driving forces for me in trying to organize something like this and bring everybody into the same room. Um, if we can just think about this from the perspective of Wilhelm Friedemann, excuse me, of Wilhelm Friedemann or Philip Emanuel, um, how, did, how did it come to be this way? Do you want to reply? I think. Um, so I don't. I don't have a, an answer to this, but I'd like to sort of just make a couple of comments. 
first of all, the kind of music that we know they collected, obviously, and we've been discussing this, um, was instrumental music. Um, the explicit anti-Jewish ideas are at least more obviously present in the vocal works, evidently. Um, works which were not really known to people, not even to, to um, avid music lovers and collectors such as the Itzik family. Um, so this is one thing. And another sort of aspect of this is that the anti-Judaism that Michael Rissen has researched extensively and, and others is not necessarily something that makes Bach an, an evil person or his sons. I mean, this is that's something that is just so culturally, no, I know, but this is something that's so culturally and theologically sort of ingrained that it apparently had nothing to do with personal relationships between Christians and Jews in an environment that enabled those relationships, I think, and, and, and sort of fostered them, be it financially, economically, or culturally, or socially, or otherwise. Um, so um, I somehow, uh, I, find, I find it interesting. But just as a reminder, again, this is, this is my ideal of a kind of conference. So. What I would love to have heard, it's a little bit off the track, but not so much, is what, it's very easy to write history from the point of view of the elite and the wealthy. But the groundswell, which would perhaps explain the problems that Jews continue to have even after this enlightenment moment, comes from uh, a different strata of the population and has to, it seems to me, has to be part of the story if you're going to talk about a given era. And we don't really know, I suppose one could guess, uh, but it would be interesting to know to what extent any of these Enlightenment ideals spread into countryside churches, for example, or countryside whatever. So because it's, it's striking that if you just look at what we've been hearing about today, it all seems wonderful. And, uh, a way to avoid to, to obliterate problems, but it didn't. That didn't happen at all. So <laughs> you open up a can of worms. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is very complicated. I mean, look at America today, or uh, you know, uh, European uh, areas where you know you have a firm conservative uh, uh, population. The small places uh, are the ones that hold everything back. But they also drive, <laughs> but they also drive history. Yeah, it's true, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems a very helpful direction in terms of uh, putting the focus on the place of politics with respect to the ongoing debate about the salons, whether or not they do constitute a critical alternative to the aristocratic court. And it appears that the narrative we've been shown is that to a great extent, this family, the Itzigs and the Ephraims, were a direct extension of the Prussian state court. And the larger question of how far the influence of now a history centered around the great women of the Salons can extend. And to, to go back to the, I mean, the seemingly strongest revision from this morning, the idea that to some extent as a hidden narrative or agenda was a support of an autonomous development of the Haskalan Jewish Enlightenment, but seemingly kept um, in a separate, if not a hidden manner in terms of her support, uh, Sarah's support as a distinguishing aspect to other female salonniers of the time. Further comments? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned America, and what's one of the problems I think I here? It's, I don't. It's not a problem, but you're 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 putting these people in this religious context and looking at it from that point. But America, it, it comes out of the French Revolution, which was anti-Christian, anti-religion, and the deists of the United States, for example don't create this, it, it exists in the, in the culture, but the conflict, I think, is 
as he was saying, is Prussia, Prussia-centric, right? It, it's a conflict in Berlin, as you're looking at it, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's interesting, but there is an anti-religious aspect to the Enlightenment that had clear expression in uh, France and in the United States. The theists were anti-Christian, uh, as well as anti-any kind of uh, religious concept that had an engaged deity, right? So uh, I think that's, you got to accept that we're talking about it in a certain context, and I do enjoy the, I thought it was a great conference. But we also have to see that this is not generalizable around the whole of European culture or the, uh, the consequences of European culture in America. And uh, the question, that question, once you get down to the populace, the people on the, in the streets, then I think you have to broaden it out of the Prussian, out of the, looks, uh, out of the look of uh, Berlin and, uh, and the, the Prussian state in particular. Yeah, I think we uh, do not need to talk about uh, anti-Christian or anti-Jewish uh, uh, sentiments. Uh, what happens in the later 18th century is a process of secularization. So uh, the rigid religious attitudes uh, of earlier times uh, in Christianity, in Protestantism uh, in particular, uh, are gone. And, uh, you know, it is possible for uh, Philip Emanuel Bach in 1786 to perform uh, the creed of the Bimana Mass and excerpts from the Messiah and his own Magnificat at a benefit concert in a concert hall sponsored by the associated uh, Freemason Lodges of Hamburg. <laughs> so uh, a secular event. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to mention Mendelssohn's performance of the St. Matthew Passion in the, uh, uh, in, in, in 1829, in a concert hall at the Sing Academy, the newly built uh, 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 concert hall. Uh, these pieces were no longer considered uh, pieces of sacred music in a liturgical context. They were religious music and uh, then primarily work, works of art. And I think that makes a, a, a big difference and open to uh, you know, people uh, who were not uh, uh, committed to any religion. Um, and Leah Mendelssohn are both extremely good examples of women who were committed, Amalia Bear much more than Leah Mendelssohn, to the Haskalah, but because they bore Wunderkinder, musical Wunderkinder, they allowed their children, their sons, to convert. And I, that's why I think that Sarah Levy, as interesting and as fascinating as she is, is a, is a, is a, a singular figure and that her childlessness really makes her seem, I don't know, more Jewish than someone like Amalia Baer or Leah Mendelssohn, who um, entered into a pact of conversion because they were so proud of their children. And that is part of, I think, the sort of Jewish attempt to show that we're part of the culture because our children are so brilliant and they're composers. And I wanted to come back in that connection to the election or the Felix not getting the, uh, whatever, the directorship of the Sing Academy. When I've read everything I have read about that, I don't understand why Abraham, Abraham Mendelssohn was not more embarrassed that just because he gave a lot of money, his son should get the position. The idea that you could say, well, that's anti-Semitism that he could, didn't get it, but it's also an incredible chutzpah to think that just because you're a funder, your son should get the position. And I don't, I, I think it, a lot of it comes back to Sholem's um, whole critique of this entire period, this entire civilization, that it was they, they were not able to integrate anything of Jewish content into their participation. And I know Shalom's is a strong critique, but every, I've been hearing it as a kind of chorus all day today. Yeah. I, I'd like to ask a question in a different context. The gentleman in the back mentioned politics, and this is the period of Jewish emancipation in Prussia. 
So I'd like to know if anyone has any ideas or information or thoughts about the connection between the, the role Jewish women are playing or Jews are playing in the cultural life of Prussia and the emancipation, which I mean technically begins 1806. So there's a, there's a political change at the top in uh, the rights being given to Jews and in their, um, at least official value being given by the government and that they're given full political rights. So there must be a connection between, oh, I would guess there's a connection. I'm wondering if anybody wants to suggest anything about that. Well, just it's not completely full. That's one of the challenges of 19th century Prussian history is that it's not full emancipation. It's a partial, it's a like 94%, if you will. So um, Jews are extended full civil rights, but not the ability, for example, to have government jobs, which included uh, university jobs and the, and the legal profession. So at least the standard reading is that until 1871, Jews do not have full rights of emancipation, as opposed to France, where the Emancipatory Proclamation is in 1791. So Prussian Jewry, German Jewry, Deborah Hertz sort of alluded to it, uh, the Shalom's critique of it is that Prussian Jews are sort of always on guard a little bit. There's always a, a, ch a challenge to them about whether or not they can be fully worthy of citizenship. And it shapes their relationship to their Germanness, it shapes their relationship to non-Jewish Germans, to Christianity, and to the state. I'm not in any way blaming anyone, but we can't really understand 19th century uh, Prussian and German history unless we understand that they do not have full political rights. And you think, well, so you couldn't be a barrister, a big deal, but it was a big deal if you're part of the, the middle class and if part of social class formation is being a barrister, right? So um, the political subtext is, is very real for, for the Jews of Prussia. And um, ironically, that, that's, you know, the pre-modern term of privilege is it, it, being privileged means it's, it's because you, someone is granting you a privilege. Having a right based on natural law is, is radically different, at least I would argue that, and it changes the shape of the modernization of the Jews of Prussia. Shmuel, do you want to add to that or you're... <laughs> it's, so, it's fine, too. yeah. So that's all I've It's an to. important comment that you're making. Yeah, there was a question there first. Just okay. women or women fighting for emancipation, we have to remember that whatever you mentioned doesn't apply to women. Absolutely. They were fighting, first of all, for rights of women, I think. Well, you're, Natalie, you could actually say more about Natalie, your... No, yes. Natalie has shown and I think it's brilliant that Natalie has shown that the Jewish women are fighting for emancipation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's brilliant in her book that the obstacle for men and the obstacle for women, it was gender, this process of emancipation, and what got more in the way of your selfhood? What got more in the way of your selfhood? And for Jewish men, who could not participate fully in the public sphere because of their Jewishness, it was different for women where their gender shaped it. So, just to echo what she said, and it's a much longer conversation, all like exhausted beyond, is that these processes of the encounter of Jews with European society are deeply gendered, and, and German, Jewish women and German women don't have full political rights until when? Deborah, not until when? Women? Yeah, women. Women. After World War One. So again, it's a, it's a very, it's a more complex process um, than it is. So there's a national dimension here, and I'll, I'm going to stop talking. There was a question for that. Yes, I wanted to revert briefly to your comments about uh, secularization um, because, uh, well, yes, but we don't want to rush to find a secular nirvana because in the in, beginning roughly in the 1780s uh, and onwards you start seeing a, a, a growth of romantic uh, evangelicalism uh, uh, in, um, uh, in the Lutheran world, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the world of Geneva and this sort of thing. So, I just wanted to, to, to sort of warn that, that we can't just jump into this. I didn't mean to simplify it, <laughs> but... <laughs> Further comments or questions? 
then we have reached uh, the end of the afternoon and I would like to uh, uh, thank everyone for a lively discussion and uh, in particular the organizers of this conference. program and I think we all have uh, felt nearly at home uh, here and uh, as is uh, a sign of a good conference the discussions continue and I hope uh, that uh, you know we'll learn more about this topic within uh, the uh, next several years uh, this has been uh, a unique contribution to the study of Sarah Levy and her role in uh, uh, the Enlightenment uh, Berlin of the late 18th century. Thank you all. Thank you.